right. This is the second in the series of discussions uh, between myself and other colleagues. In this particular instance, we have Jessica Clarkson with us, uh, who you all know, and myself. And uh, it looks like that uh, is going to be the entire complement of uh, colleagues that we have today. Everybody else seems to be off and busy on other things. Anyways, the two topics that uh, were derived from conversations that uh, we had with you over the past couple of weeks um, are the ones that are noted in the notes uh, pod that uh, you can see below. And the first question is, why would constructivist teaching consider, be considered to be oxymoronic? Um, and that's a paraphrase from David Jonason. And secondly, why should we be concerned with creating refutable hypotheses a la Karl Popper. So let's just uh, start in a conversation, and I invite you, Jessica, to um, address the first question, why would constructivist teaching be considered to be oxymoronic? In my perspective, I think that it would be considered to be oxymoronic, in a sense, because it definitely contradicts the, the definition, in a sense, of constructivist. So what constructivist learning means to me is the um, individual is able to take their experiences and create a schema in their mind or a mindset or a, a way of looking at an, a scenario. So when they are learning in a constructivist manner, they're taking new information, comparing it to the information they had previously, and then changing that in their mind. So constructivist learning to me is a very individual process. Um, so you're not able to teach someone in that sense. Um, it would be like me teaching you or trying to teach you how I see the world or how I see a specific scenario. I, j I just don't think it would be possible because that's, that's how I see it versus how you see it. Um, and we all come to a scenario or a situation from many different perspectives. I have different information in my past than you do, um, and that all goes into constructivist. Yeah, immediately what happened there is that you changed constructivist teaching to constructivist learning so that you would be talking about uh, constructivism essentially as a learning theory rather than a teaching practice or a, a pedagogical set of tricks or strategies or something along those lines. Was that done deliberately? Um, and, and what we're getting at here, I think, is what David Jonason was primarily um, concerned with when he came up with this statement to begin with? I think it was done intentionally for me to be able to explain it in a sense. I don't know how I could explain constructivist teaching because it doesn't necessarily make sense to me. Okay, let, let's explore that a little bit more then. So what does teaching mean to you and why would it not be appropriate to talk about teaching in a constructivist kind of manner? Um, to me, teaching means directing or telling someone what they should be learning, um, giving them a specific path that they want to follow. So it's not necessarily about learning in a sense to me. Teaching is all about being able to impose your views on someone else of what you think the information they should be garnering is. Okay, so it's a matter of um, passing on information as well as uh, imposing a particular process on that particular kind of information so that the students can make sense out of it in the same way that the teacher is making sense of it. Is that a fair statement? Yes. It's like a recipe. Someone teaches you a recipe because you have to follow a specific recipe. You don't really have a lot of flexibility with how many eggs you can put in or why those are there. You just follow the recipe. Okay, so teaching then um, can be considered to be a form of control um, and or uh, it's a power situation between the teacher and the student. Is that kind of an idea? That's how I see it. So what is learning then? Learning to me, um, it would be gaining information, but not only gaining that information, being able to use and apply that information. Um, Okay, if, if we went to the Piagetian or Vygotskyan kind of way of doing things, so that Jean Piaget or Lev Vygotsky, uh, two people who are specifically noted for their contributions to constructivism as um, a learning theory, how would they actually um, take a look at uh, learning? Uh, what's happening within the mind of the individual? And here I'm specifically making reference to assimilation and accommodation uh, from the Piagetian kind of side of things. And Vygotsky would have added in the social piece um, as a means of 
getting to that simulation and accommodation. Do you speak to those uh, kinds of issues? How I see that, um, if I was to put on my Piagetian hat, I would say that learning is a process by which you are actively bringing in new information, comparing it to what you have previously in your mind, and then changing that, um, that thought about it. So with accommodation and assimilation, you're taking new information that, you, um, that you've witnessed, that you've experienced, comparing that to your previous notion about it, um, and then going from there. So whether you're going to accommodate that information or assimilate it into your previous definition or um, viewpoint, from there is where you'd experience learning. Okay, I, I, I'm just going to give a little bit more definition to that. Um, essentially, Piaget suggested that there are two ways that we can actually deal with new experiences, new new ideas. Um, one way is to uh, take a look at those new ideas and and see how they actually match up to existing um, structures that we have connections, essentially, if you want to think of it that way, that we have already uh, put together in our own mind to understand similar kinds of situations. Um, or uh, so we can add to those experiences, um, putting more detail on, on the structure if you want. Or we can say, well, this particular piece, uh, this experience causes me to rethink whether my structure that I had created to begin with uh, needs to be revamped, uh, reworked, um, create a new kinds of structure based on the fact that this particular piece doesn't really fit into my existing structure. So I have to change my thinking. Um, if you want to use uh, terminology that comes from other areas, perhaps that becomes a paradigm shift for you. So it changes your viewpoint, your, your way of actually uh, thinking about those particular kinds of phenomena and the way that you understand them. Uh, so that, that would be the distinction between assimilation and accommodation. So can we throw Vygotsky on top of that yet? So what would his viewpoint on the social piece be? It would have to do with how you are able to achieve something based on um, the influence of other individuals. Um, so he viewed learning as a process um, by which you could um, participate or um, yeah, participate in a task. If you were able to do it with someone else, that would be the beginning steps of learning. But when you are able to then um, do that task by yourself, um, he thought that that's where learning would occur, um, looking at the zone of proximal development. We are talking then about um, being able to modify the kind of experiences that you've had based on input from other individuals. And that's going to have a huge uh, effect in terms of whether you uh, assimilate and or accommodate those new experiences um, based on the kinds of interactions that you have with other individuals. Uh, so no longer uh, after Vygotsky anyways, would you have learning being solely uh, the domain of an individual, but it would be uh, something that is done within a social context, uh, within conversations with other individuals. So what does all of this have to do, uh, all of question number one have to do with PBLOs? I think that um, when you're producing a PBLO, you need to be wary or be um, mindful of this information. Um, when you are creating the PBLO, you definitely do not want to, in my definition of teaching, you don't want to be a teacher. You don't want to direct the learning, focus it in. Um, to me, it would make more sense um, if you were approaching it from a constructivist viewpoint in the sense that my information is never going to be the same as someone else's information. What I gain from the world is never going to be the same as something that someone else gained from the world. And we all have a very individualistic process. Um, so to me, that's, I think, the constructivist viewpoint fit in, fits in very nicely with the PBLO um, process. OK, so teaching in the sense, I mean, if we want to use the constructivist kind of methodology, teaching um, is changed in its definition to becoming um, the production or the creation of the problem-based learning objects which provide opportunities for learning to occur. So the teaching is very, very different. It's, in fact, I would say it's so different that let's, let's throw out the word teach uh, because it has all these connotations that uh, um, 
our holdovers from the past that color everything. So if we want to look, take a look at it, then problem-based learning objects become learning uh, opportunities rather than a method of teaching people something. Uh, moving on to number two. Uh, why should we be concerned with creating refutable hypotheses? So this is going back to the whole idea of um, Karl Popper and falsification uh, type of theory, which comes from the science side of things, but we're looking at science in a much more holistic kind of way um, because we are uh, applying science now to education or to learning. Um, so why would we, we be interested in creating refutable hypotheses? From my standpoint here, my um, kind of perspective on this, is that if you are not creating a refutable hypothesis, you're not necessarily going to be able to learn from that um, at all. So if you create a hypothesis that can't be disproven or falsified, um, the hypothesis is not necessarily anything. It's, it's, there's no point of even having it. There's no point of discussing it because you can't argue from one standpoint or the other. It would be like me saying something that's impossible to prove or disprove. You can't argue with it. It becomes an assumption that's part of your argument rather than something that can actually be tested in any way, shape, or form, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's sort of like saying, um, I believe in pink elephants. Well, that's nice, but what does it do for the rest of us? Um, you know, we, we can't test that in any way, shape, or form from the perspective that we haven't come across any pink elephants, but we also cannot test your beliefs because we have no way of actually getting at your beliefs and being able to to actually um, uh, come up with a, uh, an empirical way or any other way of uh, challenging those particular beliefs and coming up with uh, uh, alternatives or modifications to those particular beliefs, etc. So what does all of this have to do with PBLOs as well? Um, to me, looking at this, it's not necessarily indicative of the components inside the PBLO. I think to me it um, talks more to how you should be viewing the process of designing or thinking about the PBLO. So how you should be kind of changing your thought process in the sense that you can't necessarily make claims unless you can have falsified information. And I think that's a, a lesson um, that can be related to a wide variety of contexts and not necessarily just PBLO. Okay, and in specific, I, I think what um, most of the students should be thinking about at this point in time is the way that you're actually creating the um, multimedia or video cases that you're going to include within your PBLOs. Those need to be um, not only ill-structured, ill-defined, complex, and all those kinds of pieces, but they need to be refutable. So in other words, you need to make them um, uh, available to a wide variety of different kinds of pieces that they can be tested by the people, by the users who are going to come to your particular uh, video case so that they need to be able to come up with problems that, again, can be tested, et cetera. Um, the whole idea that Popper was using here is that there is no way that we can prove anything. Um, because all we need to actually do is come up with another element that we haven't seen before that um, is opposite to the way that the generalization is stated, and then the entire argument falls apart. And I'm going to go back to the example that uh, is always used with Karl Popper. So all white, uh, all swans are white, um, which was a, a nice hypothesis until we came across uh, evidence that black swans do actually exist. And then our generalization, our hypothesis that all swans are white, falls apart, um, and uh, we can't move any further from that. But we didn't know anything about the problem that we had with our hypothesis when we all we saw was white swans, um, because we had not gone to the point of actually looking out for other evidence that would disprove our original hypothesis. So we can't prove anything um, because we don't know what's coming around the corner. We have no idea what the next piece of evidence is going to be and whether it's going to fit 
within our particular hypothesis or crash the entire thing. All we can do is state our hypotheses, our problems, or our, our case studies, however you want to look at it, in a way that allows for um, the next piece of evidence to come along and attempt to falsify it. Um, and that's the only way that we can actually come to any conclusions in this, this place. So proof, again, becomes one of those terms that we have to throw away um, because there's no way that we can actually garner proof. There's nothing that we can actually come up with that is going to prove the existence of whatever it is. Um, another way of looking at this, and, and this might be helpful to a lot of people, um, so when you're actually taking a look at a, a phenomenon, all that we can do is generate a number of hypotheses. The best that we can do over time with science is to cross those hypotheses off because they have been falsified. So we aren't actually getting to proof of the hypothesis. What we are doing is narrowing down the number of possibilities so that we can say with some certainty that, well, it's not that because we've disproven we have falsified that particular idea. But it could be this, this, or this, or this. You never get to the point of saying it is definitely this, but it is probably more likely to be this, or this, or this. So over the course of time, what we're actually trying to do is narrow down the possibilities. That's the best that we can do according to a rational uh, thought process. Do you have anything to uh, add to that or to comment about it? I thought I think it's interesting as well if you're looking at the ability um, to falsify um, the the Swan um, argument. Um, could it be said too that because we weren't looking at all previous instances of Swans either, that we can't say that all Swans are white because we don't have the records of every single swan that was born 50 years ago, 40 years ago, today, tomorrow. Um, so it could be throughout time as well. Yeah, we don't have access to all of the incidents that that generalization is uh, presupposed upon. Um, if, if we had access to all of those, and we will never get to the point, at least I don't think that we ever will, uh, as human beings anyway, because we are limited in terms of time and space, which is what you were referring to, um, to be able to garner all that information and be able to say with a definitive uh, voice that we have come up with uh, all of the incidents and therefore the generalization covers all possibilities. Uh, we'll never get to that point and therefore we can never say with any certainty that we have the final answer about any phenomenon and how it works and how it um, how it should be perceived, etc. So the best that we can do is offer up possibilities that can be falsified, and if they can't be falsified, then they become statements of belief or or whatever you faith statements, I suppose, and they become non-testable. Doesn't mean that they're not true. It's just that they're not scientifically testable, and therefore. Uh, they don't work towards giving us um, better understandings necessarily of uh, the underlying structure or explanations of why things work the way that they do. So hopefully all of that is um, helpful to, uh, to all of you. I know that we've gone a little bit overboard again uh, in terms of time, but hopefully I can actually shorten this down so that it becomes something intelligible. Thank you for um, participating and taking a look at this, uh, this video. Thanks uh, again, Jessica. And uh, hopefully we'll have another good conversation uh, in a couple of weeks' time.